Hi, FME OK. The US and Iran have been trading military threats for weeks. An uneasy truce is holding for now, but many Iranian Americans can't help worrying about the future. Have you been affected by the tension between the two countries? If you have, tweet us or join our live YouTube chat, and we may be able to get your comments, your experiences, right into today's episode of The Stream. After the US killed a top Iranian general in an airstrike this month, it didn't take long for Iranian Americans to feel the impact. Over the past few weeks, hundreds of them were reportedly detained and questioned for hours at border crossings and airports while trying to return home to the US. Many of them, like this US citizen you're about to see, were coming back from a concert in Canada with their families. Have a look. As soon as they realized that we were born in, we were born in Iran, they lead us to the office and they uh, held us there for five hours. They asked many questions. Uh, many personal questions like our Facebook accounts and like my parents uh, full name, birth date and my uncles who are in the US, they ask about my cousins, everything. Meanwhile in the US, President Donald Trump has toned down his threats against Iran. But he fanned anger in Iran by tweeting support of protesters who have been in the streets for the past two days. All this tension has Iranian Americans worrying about relatives back in Iran as well as backlash at home. Joining us to discuss what Iranian Americans are going through, we have Hoda Katebi. Hoda is a community organizer based in Chicago. We also have Amana Karazi, an Iranian American community leader and organizer and lawyer. Amana is based in New York and is also a plaintiff fighting against the US's so called Muslim travel ban. And finally, we have Jamal Abdi, Policy Director of the National Iranian American Council. He joins us today from Sarasota, Florida. Hello, everybody. Uh, sorry to drag you in on this conversation where it's not a particularly happy one. Hoda, for instance, we showed one example of an Iranian American and the story that she had about trying to come back into her own country. You've also heard stories like that in the last two or three weeks. Can you share one? Definitely. Yeah, I think that um, it is an incredibly terrifying time for Iranians and Iranian Americans in the United States. Not only are we fearing for the lives of many of our families in Iran, but also just trying to get back into the country, which many Iranians call home. Um, I have been in touch with so many people that have been stopped and interrogated and questioned for over 11 hours, despite being U.S. citizens, a clear violation of U.S. law. Um, and a lot of people were saying that there were children sleeping on benches, children sleeping on the floor. Um, they had no heart to even tell them um, why they were there. And any time that Iranians were even asking these um, Customs and Border Protection officers why they were being held, um, consistently, they had no answers. They were like, I don't know, it's just a bad time to be you. Um, no one was given answers. There was just constant detainment and detention and very interrogative questions. Um, and so this is a very, very just horrifying situation um, for people who oftentimes have been going through that border crossing maybe several times a week for work and now suddenly with everything that's escalating um, are treated like a quote-unquote threat. I just want to remind people that the, the tension between the US and Iran has been going on for years. There's a timeline I'm just going to show people so that they, they can go, oh, I've forgotten that happened in 78. Oh, I've forgotten that happened in uh, the 50s. I'm just, I'm just going to just roll that round so we, we know that it is not new. This is not fresh. This is news because we're covering it right now, but it's been going on for a while. Have you seen ever anything like American citizens who also have Iranian heritage not being allowed into the country? We have. We have. Mm. Um, and it happened under this administration. Mm. It was the first week of the Donald Trump administration when, um, you know, he was turning away green card holders. Uh, there were certainly citizens who were worried about coming in and who were detained and had their, um, had their phones uh, searched. Uh, there was uh, famously... Uh, somebody who worked at NASA who had his phone uh, taken and he feared maybe, you know, the data was downloaded into a government computer. So part of the reason that people are so afraid is that we have already seen this before. Yeah. And at the time of the Muslim ban, people were openly talking about how bad could this get? Mm -hmm. uh, are there going to be internment camps, which at the time sounded, you know, apoplectic and, and crazy. But with this president, it just seems like nothing is out of bounds. And so the prospect of us 
going to war with Iran and what that's going to mean for us here at home, we can't take for granted that the protections that we enjoy uh, are going to be guaranteed for us. So it, it, I think that's why people are so afraid. And we're already seeing, you know, we've seen what this guy does to us in times of peace and uh, in times when we actually had a diplomatic deal with Iran. What's going to happen if there's an all out war? This, Who's going to constrain him? This guy being the president of the United States. Mana, you're, you're nodding. Articulate your nod. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, no, I just, it was really um, saddening to see that timeline that you just showed because yeah. every single event on that timeline has had such a drastic effect on our community. Mm. And the fact that there is such an agenda to attack us, not just our people in Iran, but also the domestic front of this in the United States with immigration, with surveillance, with the way that we've been racialized, and the fact that this week there's so many of our young people that are and their parents who were the, the generation who were demonized and bullied in the 80s are now going to have to reconcile that with raising a new generation that they know we haven't broken the cycle of violence and we haven't broken the cycle of demonizing. Those kids are going to be the ones that are going to be affected by the World War III memes. So, so guess you've just given a little taste of what it's like for you being in the U.S. as a uh, as Iranians or Iranian Americans. Let me just take you to what happened on Sunday to a comment from Iran and from officials there. This is General Hossein Salami. He is the commander in chief of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. This is what he had to say. Have a listen. <laughs> We were at war with America, and we still are. We made a mistake, and a number of our compatriots were martyred because of our mistake. But it was unintentional. We apologize. We are sorry. But we will make up for it. We will not allow any one of our people to get hurt. So, Jamal, the general there was apologizing for the accidental shooting down of a Ukraine airliner. So he's apologizing and saying, but I am going to protect our people here in Iran. Do you feel, having watched the relationship between the two countries escalate right now, do you feel that we're at a, a, a point now where everything's going to just calm down? Where are we in, in, from your perspective? No, I don't think anything's going to calm down because uh -huh. at best we're going back to where we were a couple of weeks ago, which is this low-grade war between the United States and Iran, um, crippling economic sanctions, Sanctions that come out every every other day, it seems, from the Trump administration, um, and then w with Iran trying to counter pressure and taking on provocative acts to try to show the United States there's a cost to this. Uh, and what this really does is it empowers hardline forces on both sides. This is the cycle of violence that autocrats, dictators, and presidents with autocratic tendencies uh, flourish in. You know, this is their their lifeblood. And so even after the supposed de-escalation, which I think there, there has been a de-escalation mm. after the assassination of Soleimani and then the retaliation by Iran, you immediately saw the United States slapping on new sanctions. And those sanctions, they actually, among other things, have put a global embargo imposed by the United States on anybody working in textiles in Iran. So most Americans, they think of Iran, they think of, you know, <laughs> Persian carpets. Huh. If you are a carpet weaver in Iran, you are now potentially going to be designated by the United States. Uh, for sanctions. This is how deep the sanctions are going. And unless there's an off-ramp, unless somebody has the ability to step in and actually push for diplomacy, we're going to see the same inevitable conflicts happen again. And the next time we might not be so lucky to have a de-escalation, but, uh, you know, uh, we could have a, an all-out war. And Hoda, yeah, and for, for all of you, this means something because your family, your relatives are in Iran. So you're not just watching this as sanctions, something that's on the news. It's about your lives. Go ahead. Yeah, definitely. And I think that I, I don't feel like sanctions are even a form of de-escalation. Like, mm -hmm. I, I agree with with um, everything that Jamal said and that this is ongoing and this has been happening and this is only emboldening the right and the far right in Iran. Um, but sanctions uh, and the ways in which they're being applied to Iran are an act of warfare. Um, looking at many Iranians and particularly the working class in Iran, um, they are suffering doubly under already government um, repression and lack of and mismanagement of funds, but also U.S. sanctions that affect the daily lives of every single Iranian every single day. Um, my aunt is a doctor and constantly sees cases um, of people 
people who are dying just from really preventable um, you know, diseases. And so it, it is affecting every single person and particularly the working class, um, particularly those who are most vulnerable in society. Um, and a lot of Iranians, when I was in Iran just this past year, mentioned that they already feel like they're living in wartime. To say that um, a war has been evaded, um, I think would be completely um, irrespective of what's actually happening on the ground and how many Iranians and particularly working class Iranians feel today. And that's that they are living in an active wartime sanctions and the ways in which they're applied to Iran are an act of warfare. Um, not only are they disenfranchising um, the most vulnerable in Iran and really putting a chokehold on people who are trying to protest, um, but they also actually do strengthen the Iranian government, just like Jamal said. In fact, there's a whole new economy of smuggling that has been developed in Iran because of these sanctions. And as Iran controls the borders, they literally profit from getting bribed from people smuggling in um, everyday goods like meat um, or carpets. <laughs> So I think that it's doing nothing but actually strengthening the Iranian government. And likewise, um, as Jamal also mentioned, this isn't doing anything to end the proxy wars that Iran and the United States are both engaged in, in Syria and Iraq, um, where Iraqis are also constantly dying at the hands of both the United States and Iran. Um, and I think that it's so important that um, this is taken in conversation that right now it feels like we can take a moment to breathe. And we should, because we need to also know that this is a longer battle, but also this is so integral right now that we don't allow people to feel like sanctions are like a calm resolution or that, you know, th that war was evaded because Iranians and the majority of Iranians right now in Iran are living like war times at the hand of U.S. sanctions. I want to show you the YouTube chat that's going on right now. And this is uh, moving pretty fast here, going backwards and forwards. But I'm going to bring you up to date with what Elias is saying. And Elias is watching you, all three of you talking. And Elias says, aren't Iranians protesting? in the streets and actually in support of America and against their own government. Is Elias misinformed, Jamal? Iranians are protesting in the streets. And mm. I think that there's a there's sort of this binary um, uh, view that people want to put on the people of Iran. Either they're for Trump uh, or they're for the regime. Uh, as if you could look at the United States and say, oh, the everybody in the U.S. is pro-Trump. They're all, they all want to ban Muslims and hold children at the border and all these other terrible things. Uh, that's not the case. Um, but Iranians are fed up. You know, I mean, I know, I know family who, um, who, who is out in the protests right now. Um, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they support Trump, but mm -hmm. a lot of people do feel like they have nothing to lose anymore. And I do think that at the outset of the sanctions, what the Trump administration wanted to do was make life miserable for ordinary Iranians, impose collective punishment, um, undo the nuclear deal so that Obama doesn't get credit for that. That was, I think, goal number one for Trump. But their argument was initially Iranians might blame uh, the U.S., but eventually they'll start blaming the regime. And I do think that that is uh, the case. And this is anecdotal. I mean, everybody has an opinion about what the people of Iran feel mm -hmm. based on who they happen to talk to in the country. Yeah. But I think people are fed up. And there has been a lot of information and misinformation uh, beamed into Iran. There's been a whole campaign to try to make the era of the, the Shah look like it was some socialist, liberal paradise, and that there wasn't secret police torturing people, and that you couldn't talk about politics. But there's been this romanticized uh, there's been a, uh, there's a whole channel dedicated to trying to make the Pahlavi dynasty mm. look like this uh, this paradise. And so people are sort of, I think, similar to Trump in the United States, make America great again, as if there was this period of time when we were great and we lost that time. There's a similar phenomenon happening in Iran, where some Iranians are being convinced that, oh, things were better before. And so if we can just get rid of this regime, we can go back to that. Unfortunately, I don't think anybody has really figured out, OK, what comes next? How do you actually forge a democratic path um, short of working within the system that doesn't lead to a full destabilization of Iran and potentially turning Iran into a failed state or like one of its neighbors that is in, engulfed in constant violence. Yes, let me throw this at you because this came from Strides who's on Twitter right now and he makes a really good point uh, and it's really about the opinions that you are sharing with us right now. Now he has noticed that you're all in agreement with each other and it's not necessarily the case of Iranian Americans all agreeing. They, they, they can't. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you are going to be looking at, Mana, you can start, other perspectives that you hear Iranian Americans speaking about, what would you share to show the difference in opinions? 
Yeah, I mean, I so I've been organizing within the Iranian American community for the last 14 years. And, and in that span of time, I've actually never taken a stance on Iran because I think it's really important for Iranians to be the voice that we amplify. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that Iranians are extremely politically savvy, have had resistance movements for a great deal of time, that we end up in the news and in the media constantly giving space to the leaders, but we forget to talk about what the people are saying. The reason Twitter became a political tool is because Iranians popularized that as a political tool in 2009 during their resistance. So I think that's something to remember. But Iranian Americans are extremely divided on this issue, and it has to do with their relationship with the country, when they came, and, and also, honestly, we have a group of folks who came out 40 years ago, and the trauma and the anger of that has really been what they focused on, to the detriment of what Iranians in Iran want. Because for those folks, the Iran that they remember no longer exists, and a lot of them don't have a connection to the Iranians. Mm -hmm. The three of us have these opinions because our communities are under attack at this moment. We've been focusing on this. While we talk about the fact that it's being de-escalated in terms of the, the political process, and that's debatable, as Hoda pointed out. Uh -huh. The fact is that the domestic side of this has been extremely escalated. We've been up all week trying to help people who are getting stopped at airports, who are being affected, who aren't being allowed in, who are being interrogated. We're talking about cities that are increasing their surveillance on us. We're dealing with students who are pawns. They are either people who are incredibly politically savvy and should be allowed to continue the resistance that they want in Iran, or they are threats but that you can't decide that they are both. And that's their American stance right now. You cannot choke someone into freedom. And I have focused on this community. I've given everything I have, but I'm the person that's talking to the parents right now who are dealing with their kids being harassed. The American memory span, attention span on Iran is maybe if we're lucky one month, usually one week long. The Iranian attention span, their memory of what's happened between the United States and Iraq is a century long. They are able to understand the complexities and the nuances. And in this country, we have yet to let them have any kind of voice. We focus more on Soleimani than we do on the students who are in Iran right now. He is doing more damage in his death than he should be allowed to be doing, right? I'm, I'm afraid that his death is going to have such a negative impact just as his life did on Iranian people. And I think that for anyone to think that, that this is some moment of being balanced, they are forgetting that there are so many people, so many resources putting in for a 40-year war that's been going on culturally in this country to demonize us and the trauma that has continued for every generation. We are tired of it right now. And for anyone to not notice that, that means they're not reading their history and they are listening to the same rhetoric that, as Americans, they understand doesn't represent them when it comes to domestic issues. But as, as when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to my people, they're completely willing to listen to the same voices that they don't want to represent them here. Mana, I'm sorry, I, angry. We've been, we've been no, spending... No, I love you, that. You, don't, you, you do not have to <laughs> apologize. And, and this is why we wanted to get Iranian Americans on the stream today. What I'm hearing there is the deep emotion, the passion, the anger. So many emotions mixed up there. I, I want to share a series which Al Jazeera did 2018 talking to Iranian Americans about their identity. And that identity is so difficult when you have your two countries, when there's so much tension between those two countries. I want to share with you journalist Yara El Dewey. He is from AJ+. Plus. He spoke to his father. And um, Mana, I feel your emotion. Wait till you hear Yara's father. Have a look, have a listen. We came here as a student. We didn't want to stay here, but this country made us love this country, and we love it, all of us. Sorry. So we are both Iranian American, but nobody can separate us. Sorry. This is our identity. We can, we are two arms. You want me to cut one? We can't. You want me to cut this one? We can't. And this is my America. I am a writer. Yes. Jamal. Um, it's, it's, uh, obviously it's, it's tough and we're in tough times. And what really upsets me is that we are just like a lot of the coverage of Iran, 
sort of deprives Iranians of agency. It's like, you know, the U.S. has to go in. The U.S. has to starve Iranians so that they realize how bad the government is, and so they go and topple them. And America has to... Similarly, inside the United States, um, a lot of Iranian Americans are deprived of agency and end up, we end up kind of fighting amongst ourselves. Uh, I, like if you go on Twitter, a lot of the conversation is between people who think that Trump's path is the right one. And although I think that's a minority, they're very vocal, they're well organized. I think in some cases, you know, there was famously a case of the State Department. Uh, funding a group that was uh, just going around trashing Iranian Americans at Human Rights Watch and Crisis Group, anybody, and, and my organization, anybody who disagrees with Trump's approach, um, and using people, using people to try to divide this community so that we don't have political power, so that we're actually not organized, and we can actually say to our leaders and actually put pressure on our leaders, you know, First of all, you want to talk about Iran before you even start that conversation, end the Muslim ban. You don't get to do anything with Iran and talk about how you support Iranians until you end the ban on our family members. But we can't even do that, something that we should all agree uh, agree on, because people are attacking one another. And I think fundamentally, everybody probably does you know, want change in Iran. Like, I would really like to be able to go back to Iran. Um, I'm not somebody who's necessarily a big fan of theocr theocracies. You know, I don't really lead a life of somebody who is uh, theocratic. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's just say that, uh, you know. But we disagree on how to get there. And instead of actually uh, working together and building political power, there are people who use Iranian, and Mana wrote about this. There are people who use Iranian Americans and exploit us in order to fight one another, to divide ourselves. And when we're saying what they want us to say, they put us on a pedestal. And if we're saying what they don't want to say, they cut us down and try to turn, our, turn us against one another. And so you've got this, this microcosm inside this country of even within the Iranian American community, people fighting one another. And um, I just, you know, unless we can fix that, I just see us continuing to be exploited and unable to actually have that agency um, that we decry the Iranian people not having. Hoda, from a personal perspective, what is it like being an Iranian American right now? Where, when you turn on the news, you you see your your home, your parents' home, you see your family, you see your relatives. What is that like? It, it's unusual for most of us. Um, well, I haven't slept. In quite a <laughs> kind of amount of time, um, Mana and I actually keep texting each other before we go to sleep, making sure that we're going to sleep. Just because, as she mentioned, um, we've been up so late, um, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., sometimes just dealing with sudden crises that happened, um, and people coming to different airports, be having their valid student visas trashed in front of them and having them sent home and told to apply for a new one. Mm. Um, friends in Iran um, sending me videos from protests uh, and just the anger that they have there and being able to figure out how to uplift that in a way that won't get you death threats by Trump support supporters here. Um, and so it's just, it, it, there's like every time you take a turn, there's like not just one, but like a crowd uh, of, of just like a barrage <laughs> of really intense emotions. And on top of all of that, like you still have to process, like my entire family minus my immediate family lives in Iran. So on top of just having to like do rapid response constantly, trying to like figure out how to unify the Iranian community here, um, how to make sure that Trump knows that he is not wanted in Iran, <laughs> no matter how many times he tweets mm -hmm. in Farsi or in English. Although um, that was very good Farsi, students. I am told by my Farsi-speaking <laughs> friend. It was grammatically correct. There were no all caps. Unlike the rest of his tweets. <laughs> Which is pretty impressive. <laughs> maybe maybe the president could should maybe. tweet in, 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 in Farsi oh, no. more, some more. This was perfect. Yeah, that same. It was perfect. <laughs> Whoever translated that tweet needs to write the rest of the tweets because you're right. Like they're his far is great. Too bad his, his lack of understanding the situation also mm. does not help though. But mm. that's that's just, that's the thing is that um, it's just, it's so ridiculous. Um, just you feel like you're being attacked on all sides, and then you realize that oh my god, I haven't even checked in with my own family yet. And I think mm. that's what I feel like a lot of Iranians are yeah. right now. It's like we are not only just organizers and like advocates, but we also are directly dealing with all of this on a very personal level. Sure. And it feels like we have to turn ourselves into robots just to be able to process and deal and stay up another like 3 a.m. night dealing so, with the so crisis. Hold on. Um, hold on, hold on. Yeah, you you, you may not be <laughs> checking in on your family, but I'm so glad that we checked in on you. Hoda and Mana and Jamal, thank you so much. There's one more thought I want to leave you with because it's been a very active conversation on social as you've helped us have it. And so Hendrik says, I wish that both sides find a way to talk again because in all conflicts the citizens are hurt much more than their leaders truth there from twitter can't say that very often thank you for joining us i'll see you online next time take care